This is the Inner Chief Podcast, episode 261. If we ran a promotion and we got a 50% uplift, you can say, oh, look, we, we did really well and we got a 50% uplift. But if you think you really could have got a 70% uplift, honesty is saying, look, we ran this promotion, we got 50% uplift, it was great. But I actually think if we did X and Y differently, we could get a 70% uplift. That's the honest conversation. That's, that's getting the culture within the business of even better riff, that, that the teams are willing to constantly look at what could we do better, no matter how well it went. G'day, this is the Inner Chief Podcast, episode 261, and our guest today is Angus McPherson, MD of Australia for Diageo, on creating momentum, difficult conversations, and simplifying your message. I am your host, Greg Layton, founder of Chief Maker and the Council of Chiefs. And I believe there is a great chief in all of us. And that through listening to the stories, strategies, and techniques of great CEOs, each of you can find and leave your own legacy through your work. The Inner Chief Podcast is where you will learn how to think and make moves like a CEO. For over a decade, I've helped CEOs and senior executives around the world boldly lead change inspire their people and leave a legacy so every two weeks i'll bring a deep diving interview with one of these ceos or another one of a mid to large organization so you can find your own path to greatness as an executive in this episode we chat to angus mcpherson angus took on the role of diageo australia managing director in april 2020 joining in the midst of the covid 19 pandemic and australia's widespread lockdowns. He has led them through to the other side where Diageo currently represents 30% of the spirits market in Australia, producing more than 10 million cases annually. Prior to this, he spent close to a decade at Treasury Wine Estates holding various managing director roles. In his last position, he held accountability for the largest business in North America. He grew up in the wine industry with his parents having a wine bottling business. And today, you're going to hear Angus talk all about empowering your team to build momentum, turning problems into challenges and then into opportunities and solutions, having honest conversations about performance and simplifying your message for greater effect. Now, Chief, before we get into this episode, I wanted to remind you about our mini MBA program in leading high performance teams. It is a rare opportunity to come together with sensational executives from around Asia Pacific who think like a true chief to stand up and above your business and work on it. And in working with me and the other executives, we will build your strategic playbook. We'll implement your very own operating rhythm, deal with tricky stakeholders and bring your culture to life. If you want to know more, go to chiefmaker.com forward slash mini MBA. We have cohorts that are limited to 20 students. Okay, Chief, let's hear from the incredible Angus McPherson. All right, Chiefs, I am here with the one and only Angus McPherson, who is Managing Director at Diageo. Angus, mate, thank you for taking the time uh, to share your wisdom on the Inner Chief. Thanks, Greg. uh, I'm excited to be here today. It's my uh, first podcast. Oh, well, it, it's oh, gee, it's great to be first off the off the ranking. This is this is going to be great. I had a chat to you before, and you've got a really great aspirational streak in you. I, I can't wait to to hear more about that. But as always on the Inner Chief, we'd like to know the origins of our great chiefs. Can, can you tell a bit of a story that sums up your childhood and early life? Yeah, Greg, I, I think an interesting part is. I, I went to six primary schools, right? So six different primary schools over that. And did get kicked out of one of them just for, <laughs> for, for yeah. clarity. So, Good to clarify that. So was never expelled. But, but what do six primary schools mean? It means I had, you know, lots of change, lots of adventure, lots of different opportunities and um, lots of challenges, right? And, mm. and as a little kid, I, I think I embraced all of them and I see it as a positive but I think that constant change as a as a child has played a, a big ro- impact on on my life and mm. and how I see life and but also the role that I think when I look at what I do and health and I drive change and I like to 
see change in what I do. And I, I take it back to the influence of that childhood, right, of mm. primary schools over seven years of education. Yeah, right. And it was that uh, because the family was moving around, mate? Or? Yeah, moving around, moving different places, um, mm. a variety of different reasons, sometimes not that far from the previous primary school. Yeah, sure. But um, that, that constant mm. change, I think, has then had a really big influence in how I see life and how I embrace life today. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine how much that would shape you. So what was your first ever job, Angus? Yeah, so my first job. First job, or re, well, let, let's say the, well, the first paying job. Paying job, first paying job. First paying job was when I was at school and at the local pharmacy and I'd deliver um, deliver products to, I guess, the older population that were sure. not able to come down yeah. to the pharmacy yeah. during the week. Um, you know, pretty simple, pretty basic job, but it was a great one out on the push bike, um, yep. you know, in the afternoon, so that was good. And then when I left school, really worked in a bottle shop and then you kind of, you think about where my career is today mm-hmm. and the impact of uh, working in a bottle yeah. shop and, and the influence that that has had. Yeah. And um, it was sort of my first job out of school while I was at yep. uni, but mm-hmm. but it's also had a big impact because it's not just because I work in the alcohol industry today, but, mm-hmm. but working in retail, right, yeah. and spending time with consumers and understanding, trying to understand retail, which is constantly evolving and changing. but if you're going to work in FMCG, you've got to have some passion for for retail to start with, I think. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And what was your first ever car? First ever car was a Ford Ute, white Ford Ute. Um, nothing fancy about it, but I loved it. I still miss it. I, yeah. I, I wish I kept it. It probably wouldn't be running anymore, but um, it was yeah. a yeah, it was a great a great yeah. car. The good Not old really overly practical. Yeah. And the, the challenge when you're at uni and you have a Ute is that everyone asks you to help them move constantly. Yeah, so, yeah but yeah. you moved a few couches and fridges in your time. Yeah, correct. <laughs> nice one. Now, um, let, let's get on to your career a bit. Um, you started out um, pretty quickly into into wine and the, the wine industry. And Can you tell us a bit about that industry? Because it's not an industry I know much about, uh, and I s- suspect it could be quite special. Yeah, it's it the wine the wine industry is amazing. It's also incredibly challenging. Yeah. Um, it's 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 an industry that's very easy to fall in love with. Love may not be the right word, but but to in, become incredibly passionate about. Um, the reason why is because it's not just growing the grapes and all the challenges of growing the grapes and having the best vineyards and the best viticulturists and the perfect growing conditions. And that's just the first part. And then it's the production side of it, right? And it's the art of winemaking. And making a wine is never the same two years in a row because the growing conditions of growing the grapes and and those growing conditions, whether it was a hot or cold winter or summer, too much rain like we're we're experiencing Mm. at the moment versus not enough rain. So so the grapes come in differently every year, right? Um, And as a result, how you make the wine and how you create the wine is different. And why I'm not a winemaker or a viticulturalist, it is really energising to be around that and to be part of that process. And it's so easy to fall in love with the stories Mm. of the different wine brands and different wines that are making. And I think far more than most other categories, and when when I think about consumer goods, right, is that the craft of winemaking is truly craft. And I think... They've had it forever, but it's interesting. I think over time is other categories like the one that I work in today, craft spirits or craft beer, in some ways have done a better job in the last 10 years of telling the story of craft Mm. um, in terms of production and making and storytelling when reality is I think the wine industry is is the ultimate craft industry. That's such a good point, isn't it? Craft beer has been all about story and history and all these ideas, but the wine is still stuck on the label in, yeah, yeah. in many ways, right? It, it hasn't really gone beyond that. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and just somehow lost <clears> that, <throat> that, that that you know, still it's a great industry and the Australian yeah. wine industry is not mm. just green here in Australia, but they've done a brilliant job mm. in taking those wines all around the world. But somewhere along the lines, I think we're, we're, we lost, when I say we, I don't work in the wine industry anymore, mm. but I think the wine industry just lost 
the art of storytelling a little bit. Mm. And I think a couple of other categories took it. And I think that's the opportunity for wine in the future is to get better at telling the story of craft and the storytelling of all these amazing brands mm. that we have throughout Australia. Yeah, yeah. So working in the wine industry for quite a few years, I, I bet you've had a few nice drops. What is uh, the best drop you ever had and who did you have it with? Greg, great question. Because I think, you know, I, I, when I worked at Treasury Wine Estates, very lucky, uh, they own Penfold's wine brand, right? So one of the most iconic mm. wine brands in the world and clearly got to drink some amazing wines. But I think when I think about drinking the best wine I've ever drunk, it's not just the wine. Exactly. It's the location mm. and the people that you've drunk it with. Mm. And there's a wine brand in uh, in Victoria in the, near the Grampians called Seppel. Yes. And, um, and they have three kilometres of underground drives or, or tunnels under, under the winery. Wow. And that's where they used to um, dug out after the gold rush. Right. Um, and that's where they kept a lot of the, what, what they used to call champagne, but what we call sparkling today. But anyway, had a meal under one of these sort of long, long tunnels and had this Riesling, so a white wine that was about 35 years old, right? And the concept of drinking this 35-year-old white wine, which was just changed my mind, right? Because the, mm-hmm. I think most of us would think if a white wine was any older than a couple of years old, that it was probably not out of date, but probably not at its peak, right? You, mm-hmm. You're not yeah. getting, it's not at its ultimate. And it was one of the most interesting and fascinating wines. And then underneath this tunnels or these drives that were, you know, 100 plus years old, um, sort of having this amazing meal with just a group of work colleagues. But it was just this one wine. It wasn't the best wine that I've ever drunk for clarity. Yeah. But it was it was the most interesting and fascinating wine that I got to experience. And and it was quite um and ever since, I buy a bottle of uh, Sepult's uh, Drumborg Riesling every year. Oh, not a bottle. I buy a case of Sepult's mm-hmm. Drumborg Riesling every year and mm-hmm. I put it in my cellar. And I hope that I have enough um, courage to to keep them in the cellar long enough yeah. to hopefully recreate that experience, not just yeah. for myself but for family and friends mm. in 20-plus years' time is bringing out a white wine and showing them what it can do and um yeah, it was finding a, a special it was, location um like an old mine shaft and yeah i don't know if you guys are mining i'm sure we could we could <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic um let's talk a bit about diageo uh, i mean this is, a, this is a big complex business can, can you talk about um what you're most excited about at diageo right now yeah, so Diageo is sort of the global leader in the spirits industry, mm. and um, we have some world-leading brands, whether it be Johnny Walker, Smirnoff, Tanqueray, Bailey's, Gordon's. We're also really proud owners of Bundaberg Rum here in Australia, as an mm. example, and we recently acquired another little Australian brand called Mr Black, which is a coffee liqueur brand. And so really diverse portfolio. But what's the most exciting part is, is that I talked about the art of winemaking and 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 the sort of craft of winemaking and how exciting that is in terms of what you can do with wine. But once you have that wine product, you drink it as is pretty much. Mm, so yep. you, you buy the bottle of wine yep. um, in, in a bottle shop or in your local pub or restaurant. And and the person, the winemaker that created it is you're you're drinking the final product there and then, right? Yep. When we have great craftsmen, craftswomen, distillers behind the brands that we have at Diageo. And you can drink them straight and you can drink them as, as is when you get home or on the rocks. Just recently, only only last month, we had um, we had a competition which was called World Class where we had the 50 best cocktail makers from around the world, from 50 different countries, coming to Sydney to compete to become the world's best bartender at, at World Class. And you sit there and you watch them taking these amazing whiskies or vodkas, et cetera, tequilas that that the team at Diageo have made and then recreate them into even more amazing drinks and mm. fascinating. And the craftsmanship there is quite amazing. What, what's really fascinating about COVID is the opportunity of people to create their own drinks at home. And it's really generated a renewed interest in the spirits industry both local brands here in Australia and international brands, and people are 
enjoying or, the, or, or, or going back to the art of how do they make the most interesting cocktail at home, whether it be for their partner at home or whether they have, you know, family and friends over. And that is what's exciting about spirits is because you get these world-class products to start with and then you get to tinker with them and create them. And mm. some, sometimes some of the cocktails I make at home are not great. And other <laughs> times they're amazing, right? And friends go, oh, how did you do that? Yeah. And it's that whole interest and sociability of making great cocktails. Mm. And the other interesting thing is, Greg, is the growth of the local industry here in Australia in the last 10 years. Mm. I think if you go back 10 years ago, we had less than 40 distilleries in Australia today. Yes. You know, this is a, as a country. Today, I think there's over 300. I think we have more distilleries in Australia than they do in Scotland today. And That is incredible. It is, and we have this emerging industry, and not, not too dissimilar to where the wine industry was probably 30, 30, 30 years ago. And consumers, Australians, are loving understanding more about spirits culture, uh, making cocktails at home, and, and seeing how, how fun it can be mm. to craft your own special drink. Yeah, yeah, wow. Chief, are you interested in understanding how to turn the company strategy into an execution plan, how to get momentum and traction in the business, how to lead your people and inspire them to make change happen, and how to deal with tricky stakeholders and and make projects happen in the real world. Well, if that's what you're after, then the mini MBA in leading high performance teams is for you. Go to chiefmaker.com forward slash mini MBA to find out more. We run the program about every quarter and we'd love to hear from you if you or the people that you work with are interested. Once again, chiefmaker.com forward slash mini MBA. Now, let's let's, let's shift gears a tiny bit. You you have a really strong passion. Uh, One of your most deeply held beliefs is that people are often capable of far more than they're even aware of. You put the right leadership around them, the right support, the right development, they can achieve anything. Can you share a bit of a story about your own life, about how, how you discovered that through your own experience? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about personally and then I'll talk about professionally. Yeah, sure. Um, personally, years ago I was, uh, I was in Canada with a distributor and this distributor was going to run a marathon in about three or four weeks' time and he was 20-plus years older than me at the time. And I went for a run with him one day and I lasted about, you know, so he, he was only a few weeks out from his marathon. I lasted about five Ks and then took me a day or two to recover. Mm. But I looked at this gentleman and I thought, if he can run a marathon, I can, right? So I said, send me a training program. Right? I never thought it would be possible. I thought it was such an, an extreme event where you had to be this really special, talented athlete to do it. And, but I said, send me a program. I thought, if you can do it, I can do it. And I remember I went for my first run. It was when when I got back to Australia, five Ks and the next week, six kilometres, et cetera. And in the end, got to run and, and do this marathon and it was pretty ugly and not overly enjoyable. But it sort of highlighted to myself is we do such a good job at convincing ourselves of what we can't do mm. and don't spend enough time convincing ourselves of what we can do, right? And since then, I've, I've, I've done lots of running since then and I also remember I've got a similar story when I met my wife, um, she did a lot of ocean swims. I was like, I could never swim in the, like never swim one and a half K ocean swim, right? Mm. Like I, I can barely swim 50 metres, maybe a little bit of an exaggeration. But the concept was so foreign that I thought I could never do it because I convinced myself that you couldn't do it. And both those, whether it be going for an ocean swim or, or doing a long run, realised you just, it was, it was the first stroke or the first step and you can train yourself. I may not be world class. But I did learn in that process that I think you can pretty much achieve anything. It may, as I said, it won't be a world record, but you can pretty yeah. much achieve anything. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that stops you personally is somehow got this little voice in our head convincing ourselves of what we can't do instead of convincing ourselves of what we can do. Mm. You know, I, I, I had a very similar experience with marathons and, and, and ultra marathons and, and things like that. And, that the interesting thing is, um, and I think we even had an episode on why, why you should run across a desert and and love it. This just for the for the exact thing you're saying there. There's this generative experience around the way that it smashes these underlying self beliefs. 
And it doesn't does doesn't then just affect training. Oh, sorry, uh, like the, the the run you're doing. It affects the way you approach business because something that might have been insurmountable, you just know that there's a step by step process to breaking it down. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Greg. And I remember from my first marathon to my best one. Let's say there was there was over an hour time improvement, mm. right? And it was because then you reset yourself goals and you reset yourself yep. um, expectations of what could be achievable, mm. right? And from the very first one that I ran to say the best one that I ran is if you asked me at the first one, could you ever do one as quick as what my fastest one was? The answer would be no way yeah, exactly. ever, not possible. Yep. But you realize, as you said, you just got to switch the mindset, right? And then you reset your goals mm. and you set a bigger goal and a more ambitious goal. Mm. And the greatest danger is, is you may not get there, but but yeah. that's that's not really that bad of an outcome, right? Yeah. But you've got a goal and you go for it. And then to your point, Greg, it's the same in work is I found at times we're very good at creating presentations of why we can't achieve something. Mm. And we're not as good in organisations at spending the time of why we can so when you get given, you know, really ambitious targets or really ambitious goals of what you're trying to achieve as a business, the first reaction I think often is people automatically go to why they can't and spend lots of time with really big presentations of all the reasons mm. why we can't, right? And it's no dissimilar to, well, yeah, I can't run a marathon because I can't run more than five kilometres without getting tired, right, and needing yeah. a break. But the reality is you can, you can find a way. And it's the same with business. It's switching that mindset to what you can't do or, or switching the mindset to spending all your time and energy of coming up with the reasons why you can't That's right. and spending all your time and energy on the reasons why you can and what are the things that you then need to do to achieve that. Mm. And it takes a bit of time. Like it's not easy to create that shift. But when you do, you can achieve amazing things. Mm. And it's actually far more energizing, right? Yeah. Uh, far, far more empowering for the team. And mm. and it gives you momentum. And then when you get momentum, um, it, 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 it continues, right? It's hard to stop. Mm. I'm reminded of um, there's a classic question in the coaching world, which is what's not the problem? But it, it's the double negative that people normally got to think about. <laughs> we got that question for a bit. What's not the problem? Well, the answer to all that is all the things that you can bank on. Yeah. You yeah. Can, I, you know. I, I've got this. It's it's pretty simple mantra is I, I refuse to listen, listen to problems or issues, mm. but I'll listen to opportunities and challenges. Mm. And, Greg, they're the same thing, right? But oh, it's the exactly. mindset. Yeah. Yep. Mm. But it, it's the mindset, right? Like, like yep. a problem and issue and an opportunity and challenge, there is no difference. Yep. The only difference is... If you come to me with an opportunity and a challenge, is you've got a solution mindset. You've, mm. you're, you're up for trying to find a way to do it. Yeah. If you come to me with a problem, automatically you're telling me what you can't do, mm. right? If, if you switch it, it's just yep. that mindset change and it's a way that you approach it. And, um, you know, it, it's a bit of a running joke with some people <laughs> I work with around never go in there and say you have a problem. They yeah. come in and say you have a challenge. And then the other beautiful thing about reframing that is then you bring other people into it. Mm. You're, you're sharing it and, and you're asking other people to be part of the journey on how you potentially solve that. Mm. Mm. But one of the things that I, I suspect happens, which you, you're touching on there, is people often see a um, a, a challenge or an opportunity and, and they, as, as they think negatively, what are all the problems here? Because I feel like it's on them, right? And there, there's an old saying I remember in um, in rugby. I think it might have been the All Blacks. They said, "If you're down by five points and it's three minutes to go, and you think you've got to save the day, you've lost already." It's the team, right? And so you're seeking the counsel and the wisdom, and because you're trying to solve something positively, you're quite more open to help, which is how you solve challenges anyway. Yeah, correct, right? You, yeah. you, you, you share the challenge, mm. right? Um, one is that as an individual, I think it feels like takes the pressure off them. But mm. two is the beauty of sharing the challenge 
is you get all this other resource and experience and capability in behind you trying to find trying to find solutions mm. again then get to the outcome and and I just fundamentally believe it drives better business performance but again it goes back to human nature is unfortunately mm. there's an element of us programmed in us I'm sure it goes back to when we're hunters and gatherers to look yeah. at what we can't do and what the dangers are versus what the opportunities are mm. It's the old um, risk equation. I, I think a lot of people forget that risk has two sides, yeah. risk and return, uh, and they focus on the, the all the risk and all things that can go, go, go wrong as opposed to optimising the, the return, right? How can you increase the size of return and increase the chance you'll get it? And, and, and create so much more energy in coming to work every day when you're focusing on what can be done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 and you know, we 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 talk a little bit about it at work. Is offense versus defense, right? Yep. De- defense is exhausting, and if you, I don't do many sporting analogies, mm. but if you want a sporting analogy, mm. teams that spend their whole time defending normally lose. Normally lose, right? Mm. Normally lose. Yeah. Because yeah. they're exhausted by it, and 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 they're not being bold, and they're not taking courageous decisions, and they're not uh, trying to do what's. Um, what's out of the norm or do things differently because they're constantly trying to defend where they're at. If you switch it and you switch it to the offense. Yeah. So, so much more enjoyable. Yeah. Right. And yeah. fundamentally you achieve better outcomes. Yeah. There's um, two, two things we, uh, I've watched a lot in, in elite sport and we often ask two questions to the, to the um, team. It says, how can you turn your defense into attack? So how can you attack through your defense? So it's more positive, mindset and then the second one is when you're on the field and you're attacking what would be the one thing the opposition team does not want you to do right now what would be the worst thing that that and and that that just gets everyone opportunity positivity on the feet in flow uh and just makes such a a great um a great um shift in in uh mindset you know so um one of the things i've noticed in working with um, and interviewing a lot of chiefs is they often have this combination of two or three skills, like a bit, they come together to form a unique value proposition, which means they're, they're just really, really good at what needs to be solved in their business. What do you think might be those two or three things for you? Yeah, it's a challenging question, that one, Greg. <laughs> um, I, I think at the core of it is curiosity, right? Yeah. I think um, to be successful i personally think you need to be curious and you need to when when you're being curious it is being engaged in all aspects of your business yep. like it, it's it's easy to get stuck in your office and you can you can sit there or you can be out within your business and get really curious around what's happening or in all different yeah. bits and then that curiosity needs to go to your customers that's the second part of it so so there's the internal bit mm-hmm. but the second bit is it's understanding what's happening with customers and consumers. Mm. And if you're highly engaged in that customer space and trying to understand what they're trying to solve and what they're trying to achieve, um, again, I think those two elements are really important. And then my third one, we I talked about it already today, is solution-focused, mm. right, is, is this ability to... Anything is achievable if, mm-hmm. if you put the right mindset to it. But but really this curiosity of what's happening in your business, make sure you have this, this external focus of what is happening both with your customers and consumers. And I kind of I, I simplify it back to you know, first job out of school working in a bottle shop, right? Really a consumer yeah. landscape and understanding how shoppers shop, understanding what's what your customers are trying to achieve. Hmm. And you're not always going to be able to offer customers what they want, but there is always areas for joint opportunity. Hmm. If you don't truly understand what they're trying to achieve, you, you'll never crack it, right? Yeah, I think you may, like you have to be one of quite a few chiefs now that has said curiosity is really key. And I, I'm really glad you described a couple of ways to do that, like get out of your seat. Um and go and talk to people and understand your customer and get, seek the information because I think sometimes um, you can get caught up in the day-to-day and you get a bit insular in, in your role when things get really busy in the middle layers of an organisation. 
but that curiosity, uh, I love how you describe that. I think that that would be something that so many people could really bring to their work. Yeah, it's um, and and we, you move into a new role or a new business, and mm. you sometimes accidentally tread on people's toes because your direct managers are going, "Why aren't you coming and asking me this question? Why are you delving down into the organisation?" Yeah, sure. And it's not because of lack of trust, but it's trying to be mm. curious with what's going on and really get a better understanding of what's happening day to day, right? Because otherwise, you can mm. have a vanilla view or a um, a very structured yep. response of what's going on out there versus yep. really trying to get a better seeking. understanding of yeah, seeking of what's really going on. One of the things I think that is so important and sort of leads to my, my next question around your transition into the MD role is as a result of a lack of curiosity, people don't understand how the different parts of the business works. Uh, and so they have a vague understanding, oh, that's operations or that's technology or that's sales or that's HR. But the curious chiefs, they, they just want to understand how everything works. And then when they get to the top role, they've at least got some some um, some decent understanding of the way an organisation hums. So I suppose it does take me to the next next question. Um, you've been MD CEO for, for eight years now uh, in the managing director role. Um, what what have you learned during that time around? around leadership? I know know we've mentioned a few things already, but is there any principles or mantras or things that you've found just particularly important in this level? Yeah, the biggest one, and it took me a little while, but the biggest one is you don't need to have all the solutions, right? And I remember sitting next to actually quite a famous sporting coach and he was telling me about um, how they run their, their business, right? And sporting teams are a business. And he said, I've got some people that will go down in Hall of Fame players that, that are in my organisation. So he said, not getting their views is, is crazy. So he said, at the beginning of the year, I get the leadership team in and I, I don't come up with the plan of how we are going to succeed this year. The leadership team does because they all bring slightly different skills and experiences to the table. And he said, collectively, we create it. And then he said, my role is to hold them ruthlessly accountable to making sure we go and execute against the plan that we all agreed to. And I think about when I first uh, got my big, my first MD role, um, a lot of my team were, were a bit older than me, right? And I felt this pressure like that I had to have all the answers and I had to come up with the strategies and the plans, et cetera, and tell everyone what to do. And that was not a recipe for success. Right. Mm. And I slowly, you know, over a couple of years, I worked that out. And then I randomly sat next to this individual and the way that he articulated it, and he's been very successful at what he does, it just was this light bulb moment is I hire these people to be brilliant at what they do. The head of marketing is far better at marketing than I am. The finance director is better at finance than I am. Mm. Sales director, et cetera, HR director, you can go on. Head of supply, they are all better than what. I am at doing those specific roles. So it's crazy not to include them Mm. and actually harness all their capability and skills in developing the plans on how how we go and win and how we go and execute our our plans. And then the trick is then hold everyone accountable to that agreed plan. And I think the core of what I'm trying to say is you don't have to have all the answers. And if you you think you do, you won't actually succeed Mm. because you're not harnessing the talent around you. Yeah, beautiful. Point very well made. Can you, now that we know we, we, we need to harness this collective uh, wisdom and knowledge, one, one of the challenges, of course, is this holding people ruthlessly accountable, particularly if they're not performing so well. This is one of the biggest challenges uh, of in any leadership role. But can you perhaps share a bit of a strategy or story about a time you had to deal with someone in the team that, that wasn't doing so well and how did you fix that or how did you deal with that? Yeah, I think you, you're always going to have challenges, uh, whether it's your direct leadership team or within mm. the organisation, that's going to continually always happen. Is The most important thing you need to do is, one, is you need to treat them like you always do. Nothing changes. You need to treat the individual with respect and dignity. It doesn't matter how difficult the challenge, the conversation is. 
as long as you re- you treat them the right way, you can have a difficult conversation. Those conversations aren't personal. It's it's professional. And I think too many people worry about, oh, I can't have a difficult conversation because they may not like me tomorrow. And the reality for a leader is you can't control what they think of you. If you spend your time worrying about what people think about you, is you'll, 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 you'll drive yourself nuts, right? Mm-hmm. What you can do, you can control in how you treat people, whether it's a positive conversation or a challenging conversation. It's how you treat them. And if you always treat them with respect and dignity, you are going to have challenging conversations at times. But that doesn't mean that that's going to impact the long-term relationship within the business. And the reality is if you're not having difficult conversations with people that work for you, you are never going to get a performance-led business, right? Because no one ever does anything perfect all the time and we don't always get everything right. Mm. And if we pretend we do, we're not learning and we're not growing and we're not getting better at what we do. And I, I kind of talk a little bit about honesty and honesty is not quite the right word for it. But, but if we ran a promotion and we got a 50% uplift, you can say, oh, look, we, we did really well and we got a 50% uplift. But if you think you really could have got a 70% uplift, honesty is saying, look, we ran this promotion, we got 50% uplift, was great. But I actually think if we did X and Y differently, we could get a 70% uplift. That's mm-hmm. the honest conversation. That's that's getting the culture within the business of even better if, that, that the teams are willing to constantly look at what could we do better, no matter how well it went. Yeah. Right? But you, you need to have the ability that everyone is comfortable to have tough conversations with each other, mm. they're not personal. And if you treat them, go back to the very first, very first point here, if you treat them with respect and dignity, it's always okay to have those conversations. If you don't treat them with respect and dignity, you don't deserve to be in the role that you're in as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, 100%. And, and they'll never listen to, you, to your feedback anyway. Yeah, there's a it, well, there's something a couple of points there that I think are really important, um, and I just want to touch on them. You, you speak about this uh, constantly improving, constantly talking. What what this means is the feedback that you give is not few and far between; it's constant. And and sometimes when you haven't given feedback for too long, then all of a sudden you do, it just doesn't land. You know, like that that old saying: feedback doesn't belong on a shelf. Just give feedback regularly, so people get used to the to and the fro. And I also love the bit around keeping it professional because uh, um, I've certainly coached a lot of people through the years who get incredibly tense and emotional about a conversation that is often about a really simple thing like improving technical skill. Like if you could just improve your technical skill 10 20% and we fix this up, you'd be much better in your job. Well, I, that's not a hard conversation. Like That's just a simple observation and, and breaking it down. And I think sometimes we... We get really caught up in the emotion of it as opposed to we're just trying to lift people's performance in this aspect and this aspect and do that. And uh, I think you, you described that beautifully. I always joke with my wife that feedback's a gift and um, potentially doesn't always work as well on the home front. But, but, but the reality is... <laughs> but, 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 You've got to be careful there. <laughs> you do, but the reality yeah. feedback is a gift, right? And yeah. I remember yes. the best boss not the best boss I ever had, but one of the bosses that had the most impact on me was when I was sort of very junior in my career and we used to have to go and present to sales teams uh, around what the plans were um, for the next quarter. And at the end of every one, he would always go to you, what were the three things you think you did well in that presentation? And that was great. Mm. And then he would go, what were the three things you think you could do better? And you go through that. And then he would build on that, right? And Mm. made you better right and it was too easy for him to Mm. just say oh you did really well in that presentation today I thought x and y were were great Mm. and and you leave and you go oh that was great he also challenged you to figure out what you could do better Mm. and then your feedback on that as well and guess what when you came back the next quarter you did you constantly improved because you constantly got the feedback on how to Mm. do a better job of what you're doing and I do find too often in my career, and I see it a lot in the workplace, is people ask for feedback and they only ever get the positive feedback mm. and they never, ever get enough on the areas they can improve on yep. because people are too scared to have that honest conversation. Mm. 
Yeah, I think you nailed something really important um, around always helping people improve because you, you love that boss because they're helping you get better, even though you're probably pretty good at your job. Right, you were, more you would say you're de- they're dealing hope because you keep getting better. I, I remember I was uh, coaching a, um, a, a rugby team once, a semi-pro, and after the game I was walking back to the change rooms, uh, in the change rooms of this guy who was um, one of our centres, and he was the best player on the field by by mile. Like he was just so good, just dominated, man of the match performance, amazing. Then he comes up to me and he says, hey, Greg, um, any feedback? I was a performance coach. I was like, man, you were amazing. You just dominated out there. That was so good. And uh, and I was like, oh. And, and he's like, thanks, mate. Thanks a lot. We're in the change room and all was good. He didn't speak to me for like eight or nine days. And I, and I went over to the head coach and I was having a yard. And I said, what, what's going on with this this guy? And he goes, well, what happened? And I said, oh, I don't know. Speaking about his game, he hasn't spoken to me since. And he says, Greg, um, you didn't give him feedback, so he doesn't think he's part of the plan. Right, you you have to when the best guys come to you for advice and wisdom and feedback, you have to come up with something. Even if you're not ready, just say, "Mate, give me a couple of hours. I'll think about it, and I'll come back and talk to you about some ways you can be better." He does not want to be where he is now. He wants to be the level above where we are. So no, that's your job. Yeah. And I was, it was so so important um, that even your best, you've got to feed. Right, you've got to give them the information they need to get better. Yeah, yeah, and it's said. The- the worst answer is when someone goes, oh, that was all great. You did a great job. It's like, oh, yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah, you did. that's nothing. Yeah. Chief, more from Angus in a minute. Now, recently, we continued our Best Of series by revisiting a 2018 episode with personal finance guru Noel Whitaker on rising out of adversity, consistently turning up, and why honesty really works. Here's what Noel had to say about taking massive action. So I bore the cost of publishing it, which means I took the risk. Mm -hmm. Uh, I kept the copyright and it started to sell like you couldn't believe. And it sold sold a million copies in 18 months. It was named by the booksellers as one of the most influential hundred books of the last century. Can you believe? Mm. That's with the Bible and things like that. Mm. It became the book. And a lot of people said, I could have written that. Yes, but you didn't. You can listen to that wonderful discussion with Noel Whitaker by going to chiefmaker.com forward slash 260. And while you're there, the full back catalogue is there, chiefmaker.com forward slash podcast. All right, Chief, let's get back to Angus McPherson of Diageo. Okay, Angus, we've got seven or eight or nine rapid fire questions uh, to finish up. Okay, you ready? Yeah, what has been the most valuable learning program of your career? I coached young kids sport, so it wasn't a program. Wow. It teaches you simplification of message because if you can't simplify the message, you can't get it through. Teaching young kids. Yeah, I coach my kids soccer team. I can tell you that is hard. Yeah, nice, nice. So, Angus, a lot of leaders say they're really busy working in the business to the point where they don't even have time to work on the business. They get overwhelmed. That's stuck. What's your just no bullshit counsel you need to give them? A tough yeah. one. I find I have the same challenge. <laughs> I, I found a solution for it. I put someone in place in my team mm. whose sole role is to make sure that they don't that they don't do that because I will. My yeah. curiosity leads me there. So I actually hold someone accountable who's on my team yep. to hold me accountable because otherwise it will happen. I will go down there and then six months later I realise I haven't driven big initiatives. That is great. So you've given someone else public accountability for holding you accountable. Nice. That's a good way to do it. Correct. Otherwise I'm just as guilty as everyone else. Yeah. And this is a classic way of sticking to a goal too. Like um, um, I remember when I did my first marathon, I told a bunch of people I was going to do it. Guess what? You're on the hook. Yep. Yep. Right. You ever do is tell people you're going to do it. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Okay, what's the best advice uh, a mentor, a coach, a boss has ever given you? The best advice I was ever given is I'm very direct to the point and I like to get moving. And um, a boss once told me you need to be a little bit nicer to people. And I was like, whoa, I thought like I think I'm a reasonably nice human being. He said you like to keep things moving. Sometimes it takes people a bit longer to get their point across. You need to give them time Mm. instead of moving on at speed all the time. Yeah, yeah, you're a thoroughbred. You move at pace all the time, but you're surrounded by draft horses and pasture horses and Arabians who 
just take a different pace to life, you know. Yeah, and and you gotta you gotta allow all yeah. different personality types and yeah, the, exactly. their need to do it to deliver it. Mm. And as you said, he wasn't telling me I wasn't nice, but just give yep. people the space mm. to get their their yeah. story across. What's your number one interview question when you're looking for senior executives, and why? The very first question I ask in every interview is tell me about you as an individual. Who are you? Mm -hmm. So who is the candidate? Not what your experience is, not what's in your resume. Mm -hmm. I want to know who they are as a a person and I want to understand what motivates them as a human being far more than what I want to know about what's in their resume. If they've Mm -hmm. got to that interview stage, I know their resume is good. I want want to know about the person. I want to know who the person is and, and what gets them out of bed every day. Mm. To me, that's the single most important question I ask, and it is the very first question I ask in every interview. Nice. How many times have you got to end the first question and thought, well, this isn't going to <laughs> No, I've been told you're not allowed to do that. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is your most important personal routine for staying focused in flow and on track? Yeah. Outside of outsourcing. <laughs> Balance. It's just, it's it's one word. It's balance. Yeah. And if I don't have balance, everything doesn't work, right? And balance for me, mm. it's, there's family, there's friends, there's health, but the thing that keeps me the most balanced is exercise. Mm. And for others, it might there's a whole. It doesn't have to be exercise, mm. but but find your vice that gives you balance. Yeah. Yeah. And if I am doing exercise, if I'm running, in particularly running the best version of me rocks up. Yep. I'll find that I haven't, like I'll, I'll, I'll be becoming more irritable and and just not, I don't feel like I'm operating at my best. And then I realise I haven't done any exercise or I haven't run for a couple of months for whatever reason. Yep. And, and I don't see it building up, but then suddenly something is like, oh, my gosh, I'm not the best version of myself. Mm. And I found my trick is running, as I said. Yep. It, it's not to tell people to go running because everyone mm. will have their own version of it. But right, if I'm exercising, yep. I find I have balance. And if I have balance, I'm the best version of myself every day. Yeah, nice. Do you have any personal mantras you come back to again and again, like on a day-to-day kind of basis? Oh, look, it, it's just this, I refuse to deal with problems or issues. Yeah, yeah nice. nice. Right. So whether it's a mantra or not, I'm not sure, but I refuse to deal yeah. with problems and issues. I'm all about opportunities and challenges, and I fundamentally believe we can do anything yep. if we look at the world that way. Mm. What's the number one book you recommend? The book I recommend is Legacy. It's on the All Blacks. It's a very simple read. There's nothing complicated about it but I think it relates to business so well. No one individual person is greater than the team. Mm. Uh, You know, even the concept of, you know, they clean up the change rooms after what they do. So if you see a problem at work, it's your problem, you Mm. own it. It's not someone else's problem. It's a great book. It's simple. Mm. It's quick to read. Yeah. Magic book. Yeah. I think everybody needs to read that at least once. Yeah. I I I just about six copies in my bookshelf i just give them away when i saw people greg when i joined uh diazio i got this role i bought all my leadership team the book and gave it to them all i think some of them were like what's this person doing giving us a book but it's so simple and it's so brilliant yeah Yeah, nice can you nominate another ceo you hold with great respect you think we should bring on the inner chief there's a company in australia called casella family brands and there's a gentleman that that runs and owns that is named called john casella Mm-hmm. And I think he is brilliant mm-hmm. at everything he does. Well, we'll, we'll see if we can love a John on the show. See if he's up. Mm-hmm. If you could lead any company in the world and be the CEO, MD, whatever role you want, what organisation would that be? It doesn't quite exist yet, Greg, but uh, I hope it exists in the future. I think the Australian spirits industry yeah. is one of the most exciting industries coming, and I would love to see a company that is a is a conglomeration yep. of all the different great spirits coming. It's a little bit like what a Treasury Wine Estates is today sure. or what a DR is. Mm. Bits of Australian spirits companies of all whiskey, uh, gin, vodkas, rum, 
and becomes a powerhouse, not here just in Australia, mm. but becomes a powerhouse globally. So to, to give you the answer again, the company doesn't exist today, but it is yep. a company that is fundamentally of different spirits businesses in Australia that mm. joins as one that takes Australian spirits to the world because I think it's a huge opportunity. That's and I think it, become, it can become the next wine industry easily mm. and a real powerhouse for Australia. So I hope it exists in the future. And uh, if I'm if it does, I hope I could be lucky enough to work for it. Nice, nice. Okay, Angus, final question, mate. What's a final message of wisdom and hope you think is vital for the next generation of executives? I think the best advice I could give anyone is don't assume people know what you want to achieve. Don't assume people know what your goals and ambitions are in life. If you don't tell people, they will never know. And you need to make sure that the management above you knows your your ambitions of what you want to achieve and then amazing things can happen. But if you Mm -hmm. sit there assuming they know, they may not and you may not actually get the opportunities that you hope you can get in the future. Beautiful. Angus. Matt, I can't thank you enough for, for sharing your time and your stories and your wisdom, Matt. It's just been an absolute privilege. Thank you. No worries, Greg. Thanks. Chief, a thumbs up for this week. I hope you enjoyed that wonderful chat with Angus McPherson. He's just a wonderful guy, an industry leader, and I was super impressed at his incredible effort in his debut podcast. If you want to get all the show notes, go to chiefmaker.com forward slash 261. Now, Chief, if you're yet to rate the episode and subscribe, I hope you'll do so soon. It helps others see the magnificent value that the Chiefs and Gurus on the show bring to their life and career. So make sure you hit subscribe on your podcast app now, give it a five-star rating if you think it's worthy, and leave a short review about your favourite episode. I'm Greg Layton from Chiefmaker, and remember to stay epic.